What's up fellow gamers, Freak here. It's time for patch 11.10 in League of Legends. This is, it's not really a mid-season patch, but you know, there are some system changes that are kind of nice. Um, this, I think actually should be a fairly short video, uh, at least by my standards, because there's just not that much going on. Also, you know, shout out Cloud9, uh, 3-0 today at MSI Group. So I figured, you know, why not give me the extra shout out where the jersey in, uh, in the patch rundown. So this is uh, one that has, Nerfs mostly to champions who are doing very, very well in Elite Elo, Diamond 2 to Challenger. So, um, you know, real top performers overall. Um, Jinx doing well pretty much everywhere. Darius uh, overperforming win rate wise in Plat Plus. So, um, if you see any of these bans and you're like, XD get good, it's like, well, their ban rates and win rates are unacceptable in Challenger. So, unless you're Bwepo or, you know, similarly good, who are you calling? you know, not good, right? So, uh, in general, yeah, this is, um, uh, you know, I think a pretty good patch. Uh, updates to Cogma VFX look really nice, some item buffs and, and systems nerfs and whatnot. Uh, the big thing here, by the way, is there's uh, pretty substantial jungle changes, which I am a fan of. I think it's kind of nice. So, let's get into it. Bard, just overall, doing a bit too well. Really simple uh, tap down on the base damage of the chimes. Um or the meeps, I guess. You pick up the chimes, you throw the meeps. Uh, regardless, this is damage. Uh, it's a flat down by 10. Every five chimes, you get five more damage on the meeps. Um, now, in most of a real game, Bard's actual auto attack is part of this, so the percentage sort of single target damage gained or lost is not going to be exactly this number. The percentage is going to be smaller because the base damage obviously is higher, but um, there's not an easy way to correlate uh, chime count to level, so I didn't bother. Either way, just suffice to say, hey, it's still 10 damage off, but, um, you know, the percentage is never going to be this bad because your auto attacks count. That In the later game, though, you do have things like, you know, the cone AoE, and that's just, just going to hit other things. So if, the, you know, there's some, like, mid to late game wave clear down because once the chimes splash, but, eh, yeah, pretty minor thing. Next up is Darius, who indeed is really overperforming in higher elo. Now, one thing that's interesting is I actually investigated this <laughs> about a week ago, I said, okay, Darius is doing way too well in Plat Plus, but he's not really crushing, you know, silver, gold, whatever. So I said, okay, well, maybe there's a chance that, um, you know, actives are kind of hard to use. So, you know, Stride Breaker is a bit of skill expression. And so, you know, of course, Stride Breaker is the best mythic, but if you're bad, you don't use Stride Breaker well, and so, you know, it's it's just the item active is the problem. Well, thankfully, Darius' second most popular mythic is Trinity Force, which is fully passive. And so I compared the win rate difference between, you know, Stride Breaker versus Triforce in high elo, flat plus, and Stride Breaker versus Triforce in lower elo, like silver. Um, the difference does not change very much, that, like... The, the, the win rate lift by going Stride Breaker is, is basically identical in, in both of those sort of data sets. So it, it's, it's not that Darius just, like, people aren't using actives well. Like, you know, it's just, yep, you know, Stride Breaker Darius is, like, 55% win rate in Plat Plus, and Stride Breaker Darius is, like, 51% win rate in Silver. And this is after counting for, like, you know, win rate differences because Plat win rates are higher than Silver win rates. Like, it just... As a whole kit, he's just performing better in one spot than the other. Um, Trinity Force is in the relative same spot, uh, you know, in terms of, like, it's kind of okay in Plat Plus. It's really not okay in Silver. Um, just, you know, plus or minus the 4% win rate of he's doing better in Plat. It's not really 4%, but you know what I mean. So, okay. There is a 2 to 6 second cooldown nerf on Apprehend, which is really quite meaningful. Uh, Apprehend is what you max second, because not only do you care about the Yoink cooldown, which you're still going to care about, by the way, uh, but also it has percent armor pen on it. Uh, so, okay, this is never going to change your skill order. There's never a reason you're going to put points into W. This is one of the interesting things about Darius, is he really does not have an ability you can max last. Or rather, there is no reason to put points into W. So, like, after level 13, you stop getting skill points, kind of. Your base stats still scale really well, and you care about health and armor and magic resist and flat AD and all those things, because all of his abilities have total AD ratios for the most part. But, um, you know, end of the day... Uh, yeah, Darius doesn't get skill points after level 13 because W's rank up is absolute trash, which is fine, I guess. Um, but, you know, either way, again, the big thing is that because it caps out at level 9, uh, sorry, level 13, I should say, that's not that hard to reach. Um, 
you know, that's fairly reasonable. So, you know, level 13 is, is a decent portion of the game. And a 50% locker cooldown for a decent portion of the game is certainly going to be meaningful. This puts the base cooldown um, definitively uh, longer than Stridebreaker. That said, uh, I believe Stridebreaker does not get... Um, haste from ability haste like gore drinker does uh, gore drinker actually cools down faster from regular ability haste not just item haste uh stridebreaker actually respects only needing item haste for that um so you know kind of regardless you're still going to have apprehend up the same time stridebreaker is up you just aren't going to have um apprehend up again like well before Stridebreaker is back. So like that can sometimes matter as well. We'll see. Because certainly there can be some team fights where you're like, well, they engaged into me, so I just yoinked them. And then I wanted to chase the Jinx down and Stridebreaker's up, but now my E isn't. That kind of stuff can matter. This should be a pretty nominal win rate hit. All right, moving on to Gallia, who's overperforming, uh, doing very well and getting nerfed for both mid lane and support, keep in mind. So supports max W first, mid laners max uh, W second. Uh, so we have different data tables for that, but overall the cooldown is uh, increased by zero to two seconds. Um, obviously it means more the earlier you max it. Uh, the other thing is that the shield is zero to 5% less as well. So again, anytime you're going to 1.1 or W, which is never, um, it's, it's unchanged. But it does mean like the first three levels of the game are the same for every Galio, and the first seven levels are the same for mid Galio. Uh, so this is definitely a much lighter nerf for mid Galio. Again, you max a second uh, as a mid laner. A mid laner is the more common of the two roles. So yep, here's the cooldown change uh, for mid lane Galio. Again, not a huge deal, but it exists. It's there. Um, honestly, I'm I'm a reasonable fan of this overall. And then here's the shield difference. Um, it's always going to be, it's always a percent of max health. So like no matter how much health you have, it's, it, you know, these, these percentages here on the right hand side are going to be the same, but yeah, a, a pretty meaningful shield difference uh, on the W passive. So, okay. Worth noting. And then if you're going to max it first, obviously you're going to feel these nerfs quite a bit earlier. It's to the same 13% cooldown and 25% less uh, shield, but yeah, you're going to feel this a lot sooner. So it's a, it's a bigger nerf to support Galio. Okay. Fair enough. On we go. Um, Next up is Jinx, just using a simple flat two armor. Also, they reverted one of the buffs from way back when, which is, yes, now the R indeed does have a cap against epic monsters. Um, as uh, with previous times I've talked about this, um, I am not certain if uh, this means what it says it means. So it says the execute damage against epics is now capped at, okay, functionally 800, because it never hits on epics. It only ever hits on a champion nearby. So functionally 800. Um... So execute damage against epic monsters is capped at 800. Now, does this mean the total damage of the rocket is capped at 800 or the percent missing health damage is capped at 800 and you still get the like, what, 450 plus 1.2 bonus AD uh, on top. So it's still like 1500 physical damage. Okay, well, 80% less or 20% less. So, you know, call it 12, 1300 physical damage, right? Um is this doing 1300 or 800 damage to monsters? Because if I use Volibear as an example, the math just spits out the cap at the end and says, whatever the numbers were, who cares? Here's, here's your cap damage. And I couldn't tell you for sure which way this goes. Um, so I'm sure someone can test it. I'm sure someone can know. Uh, regardless, um, if it is the lower side, 800 is well below Smite late game. So that's not too bad. It's, um, I mean, what's nice is, and we'll see a little bit later, is from like level eight-ish onwards, um, every jungler, in fact, has more Smite damage than Rocket deals, which yeah, seems reasonable. Um, if it is, you know, 800 plus the, the base damage of 450 or whatever, or 600 or whatever the number actually is, you know, plus the bonus AD ratio, after you account for things like dragon armor and, and baron armor, uh, you know, still reasonably smiteable. Um, you know, this is these are both going to be um, fairly meaningful nerfs. The two armor, I think, is actually the bigger one. Like this one, you're going to like, oh, but what if it's like, look, this, this very oftentimes, like if this was going to kill baron, it was going to kill baron anyway. Um, and, and the two armor is one that actually matters. Uh, we have a quick data table on Jinx's physical durability. We can add a decimal because these numbers are too similar. Um, yeah, 1.6% in the early game, 1.1% in the late game. Uh, you're obviously going to run a stat shard in most cases that has armor on it. So, okay, it's, you know, slightly lower if we consider what plus six armor looks like. It's here. So, okay, it's actually, instead of 1.6%, it's 1.5%. Again, the math doesn't matter. It doesn't change very much. Right? It's why I don't include stat shards like this, because it's just not relevant. 0.1% uh, is not what I'm going to spend the extra effort 
on. It's it's super not worth. Um, <clears throat> but regardless, yep. Uh, Jinx still tends to end up with a pretty reasonable armor late game. Um, this is a, an okay-ish amount of armor early game for range champions. I think anything above 25 is is reasonably high. Uh, well, um, not not absolute trash, I should say. I mean, like 18 is like comically low, and that's like Oriana. Um, anything above 25 is like okay. It's not it's not absurdly bad, but it, it's reasonably low. Jinx tends to be really health skewed, um, or at least she was. Uh, I don't know anymore. I've forgotten, but Jinx used to be really health skewed and like slightly low armor. Now she's like pretty meaningfully low armor, which means you should look for, you know, being able to bully her. I guess we should actually write the right numbers. Um, not that it, you know, not that it was confused here, but um, yeah, th this kind of makes Jinx a bit bullyable in the early game. Uh, no, she has high health. She has high health and low armor. So like if you can out sustain her kind of this sort of how that math works. I don't know. It, it's wonky. Either way, um, this is not as squishy as you think because her base health is really high. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Katarina loses five move speed. Five move speed matters. Certainly, um, she has plenty of blinks, so the five move speed matters less than it would on, say, Jinx, actually, specifically, because um, she has to walk or run everywhere. Um, but still matters. Um, still still definitely meaningful. Um, you know, nominal win rate hit. Katarina is still overtuned. Four good Katarinas, at least. So, eh. On we go. Uh, Kale getting some late game buffs. So... Her flame AP damage is up by a quarter. Um, she doesn't always go Nash's, by the way. Like, some of her builds are just simply, like, shield bow into rage blade, like, on hit stuff. Uh, you know, crit, crit rage blade. Uh, some of them are, you know, um, uh, 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 rift maker Nashers, like, AP on hit. So sometimes you have that instead. Uh, for the Riftmaker AP on hit builds, that's going to be better. So the AP ratio buff is going to um, buff the Riftmaker builds. It's also Riftmaker builds, uh, Riftmaker buffs in this patch. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, 625 total range is actually now pretty reasonable for a late game AD carry. Uh, or late game auto attack carry, I should say. Um, but like, still doesn't hold a candle to a zero in terms of, of ranged magic damage, auto attack, DPS. But uh, 625 for a non-escape marksman is reasonable. Keep in mind, like, Varus is 575. But Varus is 575 from level 1. Um, getting 625 at level 16 only still puts Kale as a fairly short marksman. Like, 575 is not trash, but, you know, keep in mind... You know, you've got champions like Ash and Caitlyn and Varus that are, you know, 575 from level 1 and not, you know, from level 6. Uh, you have champions like Tristana and Kaisa with all these mobility tools. I think Kaisa's mobility tools are way better than Kale's mobility tools, for example. Um, that, you know, Kale is still generally fairly short range because she's she just kind of waddles a lot. Uh, you know, when you compare, like, what does Misfortune do? Okay, Misfortune can only walk and has 550 range. Like, yeah, well, Misfortune has her ultimate and and um, make it rain for, you know, ways of projecting threat at, you know, 1100 range. Kale has her Q, which is not meaningful. Uh, she can, I guess, ult the diver in the front line, so she has some supportive aspects. But in general, Kale is a short range marksman in the sense that um, 575 with no good mobility tools and no good long range poke tools means, yeah, she's functionally a short range marksman. Um, Sivir, you could almost argue, has better, like, range than her because Boomerang Blade is such a good part of the kit and Sivir's actually played those lethality pokes, so she's actually a poke champion. But, yeah, um, ultimately, cool. The waves now apply Muramana. That's sick. That's actually a pretty meaningful thing because keep in mind you are getting the waves maybe twice. Like, you're getting Muramana maybe twice because you're auto-attacking and then also applying waves and the waves are functionally a spell effect. There's maybe something there. I'm not sure, but a consideration, right? Um, just check win rates. Like, wait a day. Um, go look at all elos on, like, Lawlytics and look for Manamune, like, first item and look at the win rate and see if it's remotely close or Manamune second item and see if it's remotely close. And then you'll know if, like, oh, okay, this is maybe a consideration. Because, like, the pick rate's going to be really low. So just look at all elos and just, like, compare. Then you'll be like, oh, okay, I should skip it. Or, oh, yeah, I should be building it. You'll figure it out. Um, anyway, cool boss to Kale. Let's move on. Kennen is getting a, what feels like kind of a nothing buff, uh, 10 flat damage on the W. Keep in mind the, uh, bonus damage, everything else. Uh, this is a bonus AD ratio. There is no flat damage scaling in. So until you invest in attack damage, until you invest in ability power, which, hey, to be fair, is going up some, uh, to the tune of one quarter more, uh, which means, you know, rank four of the ability is the same, um, buff as the AP ratio. Just, you know, kind of keep that in mind. Um, 
but it's still pretty crappy. The AD ratio is unchanged, and again, 10 fight damage. So let's look at this overall. Um, even if you are using it and you're like priming out of minions and going and whack someone, uh, this is ability max second. We'll see for the active. It's it's not nothing, but like it's also not that big of a deal. Uh, Kenan, by the way, has 48 base attack damage. It's very, very, very low. Uh, but yeah, he feeds in the W damage. Can feel kind of good about it. 10 more damage on these on these auto attacks that apply it. It's it's something, but it's it's really not huge. Now, again, you might be able to apply this several times in a you know in a laning phase, so that can add up. This can be meaningful. I mean, it's going to do something for Kenan, sure. And if you're doing like a full on hit build, um, this is. Now, for what it's worth, and, and I don't want to kind of undersell this too much, um, if you're doing a full-on hit build, this is functionally two attack damage. Um, and I believe with Rage Blade, it should stack you a bit faster, so it's a bit more than two attack damage. It's like, I don't know, 2.3, 4, maybe even 5? Because it's every every three autos counts as four autos, so then your fourth auto instead of the fifth. So it's 20% more, so it's like 2.4 AD. Because um, you're getting 20% more. Uh, so, you know, 2 AD is not a nothing buff. Like, 2 AD is pretty decent for any sort of marksman. So if you are playing some level of, like, marksman cannon, uh, you know, this is functionally 2 AD. Eh, yeah, not a horrible buff. You know, all things considered, we've seen, we've seen you know, that kind of stuff move Caitlyn a fair bit. So, you know, it's not it's not gigantic by any means, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit good. It's, you know, like a 0.5% to 1% win rate bump, which I think is reasonable for cannon. He's not outstanding. He's not you know garbage so sure uh, next up lux is getting pretty meaningful buffs 0 20 damage and 0 0.05 on the ap ratio of her e um as far as that's concerned the ap ratio change is actually identical to the rank 5 damage change uh definitely feels pretty meaningful lux is a high win rate support i believe she is a completely passable mid laner as well so uh, you know i think lux really should just be completely viable and, and worth playing in solo queue if you like lux go play lux she's good uh, next up is Sejuani, which gets some some nice little targeting um, cleanup here, just to make her a little bit easier to play. Uh, basically, if you didn't click quite on the champion, it'll still get the closest champion to your cursor within very, very short range. Um, then if, you know, you missed blue buff slightly, it'll just tag the blue buff instead. Um, and then, you know, champions, you know, you vaguely aimed at it and they flashed whatever, like it'll still go off and then, okay, screw it, literally any champion. Um or I guess, you know, literally any target within 2500 is like, okay, look, if you if you just miss a champion, it's going to be that champion. If you just missed a jungle monster, it'll go for the jungle monster. In Like, if there was like a Braum off to the side that was tagged, but like you're clearly aiming at red buff, it'll just go for the red buff. Um, and then it's like, okay, it was a champion close by. Okay, was there not a champion close by? Then screw it. You just like pressed E. So that means like you can just jungle and like after you wail at your W, you just like jam E and like put your mouse up on the moon and then you'll just, you know, permafrost stuff. Whatever. Um... Of course, again, only if there's no target in your cursor, because, yeah, of course, if you click on it, then it's fine. Okay, so, great. It's some some really minor UI touch-up. This shouldn't change much. I'd be surprised. Like, I'm curious if Sejuani really does have win rate movement. And keep in mind that, like, you cannot trust a day one win rate for this reliably, um, in that you're going to expect, you know, around, like, 0.3% or so of variance, especially with Sejuani not being terribly popular. You might expect even more variance than that. Um, that anything within, like, plus or minus 0.3 or 0.5%, I think, on day one is is functionally unusable as um, as anything. Like, this is well within your 95% confidence interval of just, you know, you can't reject your null hypothesis of this did nothing. Uh, but, hey, if at the end of the patch you look back and you're like, actually, Sejuani gained, you know, 0.8% win rate patch over patch. Like, okay, this this mattered. Um, we'll see. I don't think it's going to do much, but I don't I think this is a bad change by any means. Next up, Talon. Um, point went off the bonus CD ratio on Q. Cool. Um, I somehow didn't write this down. I don't know how I failed to write this down, uh, but this is 31 less health at level one and, uh, you know, two less health growth, which basically takes until level like 16 or something uh, or 17, I think, to catch all the way back up. Um, Thresh typically does not reach level 17. Um, this is just a solid. Okay, so 31 is like, what, um, eight? percent seven percent of level one health so it's it's a seven percent health decrease at um level one i mean we could just do the really quick math right so uh five 530 of 561 um yeah okay six and a half percent right uh or five and a half percent what did i say five six percent or did I, say? I think it's a six percent or seven percent um so yeah five and a half percent lower health at level one um we can, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this, but we can lower the decimal. So it's, look, it's exactly five and a half percent. Look at me. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, Thresh, he's had his Flay cooldown nerfed. He's had his uh, Lantern cooldown nerfed. Now it's like, all right, 
here, just just take some base health off. Go for it. Next up, they'll probably lower his armor by two. They're just like, you know what? Screw it. Like, just get this guy's win rate into a normal spot. Um, what's funny is I think if they had thrown all the nerfs at once, if they did all the all the E and W nerfs, I think that would have done more to like lower the perception of the champion, and I think the ban rate would have plummeted a bit more. Um, I think the win rate's still quite good. So hey, whatever. But I don't know. It's something interesting, right? Like this is the you know third patch or every other patch in a row where uh it's like well here's some more thresh nerfs it's like okay sure whatever um yumi is getting 10 flat damage on her q and 15 flat damage on her empowered q keep in mind q has a um percent max health damage off of it so here's the easy flat 10 if you don't manage to swirl the q around for long enough uh, if you do though it's actually uh arguably more meaningful especially in most of the early game uh, basically up until yeah, up until like level nine or so, um, this is an even bigger percentage bump to the Empowered Q, and that's with Empowered Q having percent health damage on it. Um, so pretty big deal. I mean, the fact that your uh, level eight Q is 240 damage and like pretty hard to miss, this is a really meaningful amount of poke damage. I mean, especially early game, right? Where um, this is always applying area. It's almost always applying Scorch if, it, if you know, you're running that one. So... Um, Pretty pretty meaningful amount of, of poke damage. Uh, again, the percentage is lower if you're running things like Aerie and Scorch, of course, but it's still a pretty big deal for just saying, you know what, screw it. Like, we're picking up Yumi and we are poking you and you're going to feel it. Like, this is really going to add up. I uh, One to keep in mind is, though, sure, Doran's Blade is really commonly picked up, uh, and if not that, Doran's Shield for a bunch of regen. Um, AD carries naturally have very, very, very low health regen. Um, that is, I think, a, a meaningful thing to keep in mind. Um, matters quite a bit um, that, that they don't have native high health regen. So if you can push them off the wave and they can't chain auto attack the regen back up, uh, they've got their one potion and that's kind of it. They're, they're regening, you know, under, under 60 health a minute. Um, it, I mean, it takes literally a full minute to, to, you know, recoup from a Yumi Q. Yeah. This book's going to add up for a while. Uh, so yeah, it should be pretty strong overall. They're finally fixing the UI bug from the W on and off. That's a good thing. Thank you, Riot. Uh, next up is Zyra. Zyra is not in that bad of a spot. Um, I think she, she's like a reasonable pick in support right now. She's roughly balanced. Uh, but okay, some nominal buffs to Zyra is going to push her, I wouldn't say over the edge. I think these are pretty small buffs, but she's really going to be on the strong side. She's definitely going to be an overall strong support worth picking. Just, you know, be careful you don't get completely ruined by um, by Leona, uh, just because you really can't peel Leona engages. Um, hope your AD carry is Ezreal and you can play behind him because you are absolute food. If uh, if an engaged support gets on you and you can't block any of Leona's stuff, uh, but okay, five percent more slow on the um, E, not bad, pretty meaningful. Um, I mean, anytime anytime you land your root, you're almost always going to land the the Vine Lasher underneath it. So once they're done being rooted, they're going to take thirty percent slow, and yeah, that's going to be meaningful. Um, otherwise, the two second cooldown on W is less good than you would think, and there's two reasons why. So first of all. Um, Unlike most things that regain cooldowns, Zyra regains a percent of her W back uh, when she triggers special conditions. So, you know, if this is like, oh, get two seconds back every CS, you're like, oh, wow, if I get six CS every time, um, you know, or or four CS every time, we're turning an eight second cooldown uh, because, or sorry, when we're lowering it by eight seconds, it's going to be four CS, you know, we're turning a four second cooldown to a two second cooldown um, off of my every four CS. Like, oh, that's really good. Um, no, um... Instead, Zyra gets a full seed on Killer Assist, and she gets 20% of a seed um, on CS. So every five CS is a seed, no matter what the cooldown is. Um, which means Zyra's getting a bunch of just, like, flat, free seeds anyway. Um, so so a large percentage of her seeds are not based on the cooldown. They're just based off of her getting CS or getting kills or getting assists. So the cooldown is less relevant than, you know, uh, other abilities that are based on cooldowns because she's just getting free charges. Um... You know, functionally, every time you walk in a lane from base, you've got two charges ready to go regardless. So, like, that's easy. Um, the second part that matters is um, W is not usable by itself. Just pressing W and putting a seed down doesn't doesn't do anything at all. Uh, so you always have to wait for your Q or your E to be back up. Sure, you can put more seeds down and those can be useful. And then you can put more plants on and that's, that's not a bad thing at all. Um, but... Uh, plants have multi-hit damage decay, so if you have more than one plant hitting someone, they're taking they're not taking full damage from the second plant. So um, even if you are getting somehow a fourth a fourth plant instead of a third plant uh, because of this cooldown change, you are not getting one third more damage. You're getting more like I don't know one sixth ish or something more damage, uh, or like one tenth something around there. I forget how the falloff works exactly. I didn't look it up before the video, so it's not as big as you might think. It's not gigantic. 
Um, but, you know, this combined with this, sure, you know, a, a small buff, I'm going to call it like 0.5% or something. Um, again, Zyra's already fine, so I don't think she really needs big help. If people are going to play more Zyra because this buff, cool, that sounds good, because I think Zyra's a cool champion. Uh, next up, we have item uh, buffs mostly, but some changes overall. Abyssal Mask is getting 50 more health, and the passive is getting buffed by not only 5% damage amp, but a one second longer duration. Abyssal Mask really is getting most looked over. Yeah, here's the cool difference, by the way. Um, w Max second is the most common, um, although Q Max second is really close behind in pick order, and the win rates are pretty close as well, so eh, whatever you want to do. Um, Again, because of the things I mentioned, cooldown on W is not as important as you might think. Uh, normally, a buff like this would make you go more toward uh, maxing W second. But again, there's there's not so much incentive to do so, so it's not always that important. Okay, let's talk about Abyssal Mask, okay? So it's here at the bottom of the screen. Cool, cool beans. Um, basically, it is gaining... As we can see, about 133 gold worth of value, which, hey, not bad. It means it goes from 75% gold efficient to 80% gold efficient, also not bad. Um, and, hey, you know, other way of thinking about it, instead of paying about 700 gold for the for the passive, we're paying 550 for an even better passive. So certainly this should make you turn heads and say, yeah, or make you turn your head. It, this should turn heads, whatever, we finish the sentence. Um, this is pretty meaningful. And I want to say, by the way, that uh, Abyssal Mask, uh, with, with this change, before this change, actually, um, is is pretty well in line line with other uh, tank items. So so tank items in general, um, this is kind of always true. They always tend to be, you know, 70 something ish percent gold efficient. I'm making that number up kind of right now, but it's about accurate. Um, and you're just paying for the unique pass for the rest of it. When you compare to like a lot of marksman items, some of them are just gold efficient. And then there's just some gravy on top. If you look at mage items, it's often true as well. Um, things like uh, Riley's and death cap and, and, and whatnot tend to be really good. Their mythics tend to be really good uh, for that regard as well. Um, there's an argument to be made that their stats are over over costed, overpriced, but different discussion. We'll 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 move on. Um, so, but the, the thing I want to point out, right, is Abyssal Mask is a 2,700 gold item that gives now 2,150 functionally worth of stats. You're paying 550 for the unique passive. And so, what I wanted to do was compare it to the other MR items you can buy, and it's like, look, we're just looking at health, MR, and the other stuff. Like, who cares? So, Spirit Visage and Force of Nature are right here. Um, and they both cost more, right? They're 2,900, not 2,700. Um, but you can see here that Spirit Visage is um, 1,900 gold worth of pure durability. Whereas, uh, I guess we should be using this one always, right? 2,147 versus these numbers. So what was interesting is Force of Nature, by the way, had the exact same stat profile profile as Old Abyssal Mask. Um, now, New Abyssal Mask is, is absolutely the king of flat durability, right? It just strictly has the most health and the most MR. Um... Well, I mean, the, mo the, okay, the, the most sort of combined health and MR gold value. Now, a couple of things that I want to kind of mention real quick. One, I'm a huge fan of the uh, gold value of health and MR being functionally identical. I don't think this needs to have 402 HP to make the numbers line up. I think it would actually be 405 HP to make the numbers line up and be really, really pretty. That's obviously not what I'm actually asking for here. Um, but say, okay, cool. Like, they're both about 1100 or, or 1050 in durability sets. That's kind of nice. I, I am a big fan of tank items pretty much ubiquitously um, having their gold value split um, half into health and half into armor uh, in, into like the, the primary, like, well, the, the, the secondary defensive stat of armor or magic resist, which means that, um, right, you are, you know, health is good against Renekton and armor is good against Renekton. Or, you know, health is good against Syndra and MR is good against Syndra. Uh, but thankfully, half of my item, in terms of its durability stats, is good against everyone, right? So if I buy Abyssal Mask and I get lane swapped on, I'm going to get Zernectin, or I have to tank, uh, you know, a Callista in a team fight. Well, don't worry. I mean, Unmake is, is target agnostic, right? If I see so you take more damage, cool, whatever, I'm paying for that no matter what. So only half of my durability budget, only 40% of my item, is getting ignored by by the Callista. And that seems, I don't know, pretty cool to me. Like, I'm I'm a fan of that, right? That only 40% of my item is ignored. Like, when you compare to, for example, and I'm going to keep Ragnar's item because the item is freaking garbage, Frozen Heart is 100% ignored by Azir. Um, I mean, unless I'm on top of him, then okay, sure, fine. Frozen Heart is 100% ignored by Syndra. Um, literally zero of Frozen Heart affects the enemy Syndra in any way. And people wonder why this item isn't bought. I don't think anyone actually does wonder why the item bot isn't bought, but like, 100% of Frozen Heart is ignored by mages. Um, yeah, that seems like a problem, doesn't it?
and it's not even the best armor item, so why would I buy it? Um, <laughs> so it's like, I I will reiterate every time I talk about these items, I am a really, really big fan of the the prices, of, of the, the, the stat values of these items being split 50-50 across the primary defensive stat and health. Um, I'm still not a super fan of things that give armor and MR, although there's... Again, it's, it's another stretch for another time, so we're just going to keep skipping on. Uh, but let's talk about the fact that Force of Nature is, um, in fact, very magic is skewed. Now, of course, the other stuff in this item has things like movement speed. It's, I think, correct that you're paying more for the other stuff because Unmake is not percent move speed and stacking MR and stacking move speed in combat and things like that. Like, that thing is fine to just, like, to have, you know, a bigger other stuff end over there. Um, but it's just kind of nice to know that, like, hey... All of these tank items give me about 2,000 gold worth of tank stats. It's about 50-50 in health versus MR, asterisk here, of course. Um, and off we go. Now, of course, here we have Spirit Visage, which is like, well, actually, Spirit Visage is mostly just a health item. And it happens to have MR on it. Um, there's an argument that Spirit Visage should be more general, because you buy Spirit Visage because you have healing synergy, not because you want to be anti-mages. And like, I buy that. Um, and, you know, on a similar vein, like, Thornmail, I think, could totally do with um, a stat profile like this because it's the Grievous Wounds item and it feels bad to buy a crap ton of armor because you need to apply Grievous Wounds to the, I don't know, Gwen. Uh, even though, yes, she does auto-attack you and, sure, she's going to apply the, the passive on the Bramble Vest too, but, like, man, would it feel bad buying 80 armor on... Uh, you know, to fight a Gwen, even though it's, like, optimal to buy Thornmail against Gwen, and Thornmail this season doesn't have AD armor, and that was my suggestion, and the designer was like, yeah, makes sense, in we go. Um, but, you know, yeah, maybe there should be an MR Thornmail, but, uh, you know, just wanted to point out, again, these items give about 2,000 gold worth of durability, um, and then you pay for the other stuff, and that seems fairly reasonable. Now, some of the Spirit Visage also is, like, functionally just health regen, so it's even more health on top as well, um, which is a direct durability gain afterwards, but okay. Uh, anyway, yes, Abyssal Mask looks pretty good. You're not paying a lot for the unique passive, and again, it has the most raw defensive stats of any item. Force of Nature, asterisk there, because it just gives you MR as soon as you enter combat, basically. All right, next up, Gore Drinker is getting a bit more percent missing health on top, just getting a very slight buff to say, hey, Gore Drinker should be good on frontline fighters. Now, it's not going to, you know, replace on Darius or anything anytime soon, but it's like, hey, look, if I'm just trying to be a beefy bruiser and I just need to be there on the front line and I don't have to do anything special, we don't have a tank and, you know, I don't want to just go Sunfire set because I have AD ratios that matter and I just need a front line. It's like, well, cool. Gore Drinker is the item for you. It's just going to make you tanky. Now, Gore Drinker, I think, is very, very underrated. Now, some champions like Darius you're just hard bound to Stride Breaker, and there's no way you're going anything but Stride Breaker on Darius. Uh, but there's a lot of champions that underrate Gore Drinker on them. So, for example, uh, Lee Sin. Now, for a lot of lane Lee Sins, we are seeing Gore Drinker from them at MSI, but like a lot of Lee Sins were like, but what if I Stride Breaker to make the insect kicks easier? It's like, it doesn't matter. Just, just build the Gore Drinker and be beefy. Like, just go be a tanky boy. It's fine. Um, you know, champions like Renekton. And, uh, you know, any other just, like, sit out there, you know, and just tank things up. Like, these items are quite good. Um, the one I'm going to keep shilling for is Gore Drinker Nocturne is very good. Um, turns out that really, in most cases, if you are going to get the fear with Stride Breaker, you're going to get the fear anyway. Um, that, like, a lot of the cases where, like, if they're going to break your tether, they're probably just going to break Stride Breaker's tether anyway. Um... And, and there are occasionally some cases where the Stride Breaker leap and slow gets you in. But I'm going to say there are a lot more cases where Gore Drinker makes you survive a team fight. Um, because Nocturne can only ever go in and then stay in. And getting 600 health back because of a Gore Drinker active is a really, really big deal. When you have to dive on the back line and just auto attack and hope it's good enough. Um, Gore Drinker is really good. And, and yeah, in that case, Nocturne is functionally kind of a heavy fighter. He's just like, he dives in. And he's just there. And it's like, look, his damage is not high enough to one-shot. It never is. He's not Renekton, where, like, Renekton actually can one-shot and go for a Prowler's Claw build as a result. I really do think Gore Drinker Nocturne is uh, quite reasonable and a, 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 you know, totally reasonable choice. Uh, but, you know, things like Red Cane is just like, yep, I just buy a Gore Drinker and I just, I'm just a beefy boy. Um... Uh, but also the idea of saying, look, I can just buy Gore Drinker first item to, like, fight my lane opponent, and then just go for, you know, mostly tank stuff. Like, yeah, okay, I might end up building a Sterix, but, like, yeah, we're gonna go for just 
a thorn mail or something uh and just front line and we're gonna buy a spirit visage or or whatever like that kind of stuff i think really is um it does have potential either way uh it ends up being a pretty small buff they're trying to buff it for um you know bigger heavy tanks that are just going to stack health and, and be a frontliner um less for the rivens we're just trying to like I press the buttons and tap, I just do some bonus damage. Next up is Rageblade, getting 200 gold cheaper. 200 gold is quite meaningful. Um, it's That's functionally like six attack damage. Um, let's see, it's uh, what, AD divided by 200, I think. Uh, nope, it's 200 divided by AD, I think would be the way. Oh, come on. Yeah, 5.7, six attack damage. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so that means, you know, in any given on-hit build, you are... Uh, you know, 4% attack speed because you're, well, no, you're, you're 6% attack speed because you're half a dagger, more than that, but whatever. Um, I guess that makes it 8% attack speed because two-thirds. Uh, you know, you're, you're 8% attack speed or 6 AD farther along in your build. You're, you know, fairly likely, you know, at some point, like, you're going to combine this item when you couldn't have otherwise, or you're going to combine a zeal when you couldn't have otherwise. In fact, this gold difference is, um, actually more than the price of a zeal combined, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, fairly meaningful, right? Um, there aren't a lot of Rageblade users. Uh, this will help change the math a little bit. We know, for example, Senna is increasingly, increasingly, increasingly just building full tank because why wouldn't you? That's how that's how her kit hooks her kit hooks actually work. She's building full tank, so you know that one's happening. Um, as Rageblade gets stronger, there's some consideration to go back. But I mean, as we saw from uh, a lot of like. Uh, you know, late season LCS games, for example, uh, you can just kind of sit on Rage Knife and just go build something else because the value of going all the way to Rage Blade is not that high. Um, this helps push the math back towards just finishing Rage Blade, um, pretty meaningfully so, honestly, since um, you know now it's only sixteen hundred gold to to go there from Rage Knife and not eighteen hundred gold, so that that's a pretty meaningful difference, right? That's one ninth less. Uh, which yeah, that that matters. So um, yeah, I should see a few more rage blade carries. Uh, this this helps Kale decide to go for uh, you know a, a shield bow or kraken slayer rage blade build more likely. Um, this helps Kalissa decide to go rage blade instead of hurricane. This helps Varys decide to go rage blade on hit um, because being two hundred gold farther along in your build is is a pretty meaningful consideration. Uh, next up, Riftmaker. Uh, now is going to stack from taking damage. So if you end up getting hard CC'd at the very beginning of a fight, um, you're still going to start building up your stacks. And hey, by the way, instead of stacking five times, it stacks three times. Um, yeah, technically the max is 9%, not 10%, but um, this is overall a buff to the item. Riftmaker just strictly is stronger. Um, people tend to overvalue how long fights are and how long you're going to keep things like Leandries or full stack Riftmaker going on. Um, so in general, I think people are, are bad at understanding that. And so... Uh, these kinds of buffs tend to be understated. Uh, this is pretty meaningful because um, getting getting the full stack and converting your bonus damage into true damage is a really meaningful thing to have happen at any point in time at all. Um, so yeah, pretty big stuff here. Next up, Phase Rush getting pretty heavily nerfed. I mean, it's a really, really big deal. So it's a flat um, uh, 10 to 0% move speed nerf for melee and 10 to 0% move speed nerf for ranged, as well as a very meaningful 15 to eventually 5 second buff. Uh, second cooldown, mostly nerf, which is uh, really, really meaningful. So here's phase runs cooldown before and after. Yeah, it's a really big deal for the first... I mean, it's a huge deal really, really early on in the game. Um, so much so that, like, now, basically, if you take a trade in lane, phase run or phase rush uh, is probably on... My PoE is showing. Um, phase rush is almost certainly on cooldown when a jungle gate comes by. Um, because, hey, okay, sure, it's it's the late game is not level one forever, but... Hey, uh, the cooldown is two thirds longer, um, even you know in the you know up till six minutes in the game. Uh, that really really increases the odds that you just don't have phase rush available when the Udyr comes by to gank. So you can't just you know Q W E as Victor and run and trigger phase rush because nope, you're you're not any faster. You're gonna get caught. Um, and even if you do trigger it, hey, by the way, here's the move speed. Now for ranged, it is um, a slightly bigger nerf overall. You can kind of see based on, you know, 93 versus 92%. Um, it's still a meaningful nerf in both cases. I don't think Phase Rush is super metal warping for melee champions. I know we are seeing, like, um, Phase Rush Udyr, and that's sort of a thing. Like, yeah, it's good. Don't get me wrong. But, like, whatever. Um, I guess one thing to keep in mind, right, is for a lot of junglers, 
Um, phase Rush just happens once per team fight anyway. So the cooldown change doesn't really affect junglers. Uh, but junglers who use Phase Rush tend to be melee, and so the move speed nerf at, you know, 6 to 7 to 5 to 4% for the first few levels of the game um, does somewhat affect junglers. But, you know, your keystone provides 8% you know, additive 6% multiplicative less movement speed is not a gigantic nerf that's going to remove Udyr, you know, in any way. It's it's a very light nerf, but it's not a, a huge deal. Hecarim, by the way, is still a dumpster. Um, what really matters, though, is for champions like Victor and Orianna in mid, where this cooldown really, really affects them, and this is going to have huge, huge effects on not only what keystone they choose, but then how mid lanes play out and what kind of mid laners are viable, because, hey, if... if I'm not sure if it's true, right? But like, if if Phase Rush Victor is one percent higher win rate than than Airy Victor or Electrocute Victor um, across most matchups, and Phase Rush Victor is now unplayable, uh, well, Victor's lost one percent win rate in most matchups. Um, that is enough of a move to make you not play Victor as much. Um, which means if Victor's not getting played, what else isn't getting played? Like, what counter matchups are getting played? What what blinds are now safe because Victor's not going to get played? Like, these things all matter um, and are real considerations. So this 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 may be the second biggest change this patch uh, behind what's coming up next, which is the jungle changes. And I know we're up to 40 minutes already. We tried to move on quickly, and we're still going to hit almost an hour. Um, crud. We try to get under an hour. We'll see what happens. Uh, okay, so jungle has changed a lot, yes. So basically, they're relaxing camp timers back to 2 minutes 15 seconds from 2 minutes. Um, this is something that I, I knew was being considered earlier on in the year. And as soon as I heard it, I'm like, yes, this is exactly the change that needs to happen. There's no way the jungle can't revert back to a little bit slower. There's, there's too much pressure on junglers to, to turbo clear. And the thing is, the thing is, it is not actually mandatory to turbo clear. There are plenty of viable junglers that do not get level 6, or sorry, do not get all 6 camps done at 3 minutes 15. Um, Lee Sin jungle has a far higher win rate than Rumble jungle in Masters Plus, to the tune of like 4% win rate. If you tell me Masters Plus players aren't playing the game right, I don't know what to tell you. Rumble Jungle absolutely gets all six camps done at 3.15. Lee Sin literally never can. By far the stronger jungler. And this win rate difference holds at other elos that are lower down the line as well. It's not just, well, Masters players know how to snowball. It's like, no, 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 it works in Plat Plus too. Like, you, it is not mandatory that you clear six camps down. This is, in some ways, a huge perception issue. But honestly, perception issues are all that matter in game design. Uh, because... All people do is use their perceptions to then make decisions. The, people don't use objective truth almost ever, or they wouldn't be picking Rumble Jungle as often as they are currently at MSI because they're all bad at it. They're objectively bad at the champion. Um, it, it's not terribly successful. And they keep playing it. And they keep losing. So, who knows? Uh, but, okay. Perceptions getting changed. The camp respawn timers are getting pushed back by 15 seconds, which means, look, the the... Six camp clear by 315, that metric hasn't changed, but the the desire to go back and clear four more camps and then get stuff done, and then clear four more camps to get stuff done, the get stuff done portion has 15 seconds longer, which means if you are Lee Sin doing your second or your third clear, um, like, let me put it sort of this way, right? Um, if it takes you a minute versus a minute and 15 seconds to full clear your jungle, um, you know, after you're going for the respawns, right? If it takes you a minute in, in the old jungle, the 11.9 jungle, that means you have exactly one minute of downtime to gank, to go deep ward, to recall in shop, and to walk all the way back to the top side of the jungle and do it again. Um, or, you know, wherever you're starting your camps off, right? Um, if it takes you a minute 15 seconds to full clear, you've got 45 seconds to gank, get deep vision, recall, and get back to the start. Right, between one minute and 45 seconds is a pretty meaningful difference in free time. If that difference becomes 115 to one minute, that is a less harsh, you know, constraint on what you can get done. Um, that's functionally what's different now. Because, look, you still want gold income. You still want experience income. These aren't nerfed very heavily. The gold income especially not nerfed very heavily. The XP income somewhat so. Um, but, you know, you still got to do your stuff. You still got to get your camps done. That income still matters. Um, but 
you know, now more of the game is what you're doing in the downtime because there's more downtime, right? More of the game is the downtime between camps. So if you're just Rumble Jungle power clearing and doing nothing else, or Karthus Jungle power clearing and doing nothing else, it's like, well, Lee Sin got 15 more seconds to gank bot with. That US Karthus did, what, recalled early and sat at Krug's waiting? Like, that's not very good. And, and so this is this is a somewhat of a metagame push, right? Where, uh, I mean, it's really just a game push, uh, more so than a metagame push. But um, now the things you do during downtime when not farming are a bigger part of what makes a jungler good. Certainly, yes, clear speed, especially when the, when the timers are shorter and shorter and shorter. Like, imagine the, the timer on a full camp, on a full jungle respawn, is a full minute. Um like, that means, you know, the, the actual gameplay could be literally only power clear and have the most golden XP in the game. Lee Sin can never perform that, that job, but Karthus can, right? So that was a job that Karthus could do that Lee Sin could never do, which means that potentially that's just like the best play style and, and off we go. Um, but the, the, the longer the respawn timers are, the more the downtimes matter. And, and the big thing is you need to find the right actual balance between the two. Ultimately, that's that's where it actually lies, is where do you find the right balance between the two? Um, because if the respawn timers are too long, like they're five minutes, the only thing junglers do is downtime. Clear speed is fully irrelevant. Um, and all that matters is how good your ganks are, which means like, well, all I want are trundle pillars. Um, and, you know, Lee Sin waiting for his ult to come back to go for a kick flash or, or a ward hop kick because nothing else in the game is relevant. But, but how absurdly powerful my gank is doing bot and then ganking mid and then ganking top. So finding the right balance is obviously what they're looking for here. I think 215 is going to be a pretty good balance in the middle. Um, I think ultimately the the idea of getting six camps done and getting one of the scuttles is still going to be something that's strong, right? And something that's special to Udyr and Morgana and Rumble and, and a few other power clearers and like, hey, you know what? You earned it. Congratulations. You did something cool. Good job for you. Um, but this opens up more space, especially perception wise for champions who can't turbo clear. Um, you know, like, yeah, you're still not getting, you know, you're not winning the 1v1 at Scuttle level 4, so, hey, you're going to lose, you know, one of the Scuttles, and if you pathway, you can get the other one instead. Um, yeah, you're going to be a little bit behind in XP and gold at the very beginning of the game, but, again, there's more time to do other stuff, so if you're more of a ganker, there's more time for you to um, do well. Next up, there is Comeback XP getting added, and it's in a much, much softer version to before. Uh, basically, uh, so the way jungle camps work is they spawn at the average level of champions in the game. Uh, at at whenever it spawns, not counting Dragon or Baron, those level up dynamically, same for Herald. Um, but you know, when when your Krugs or your Gromp or whatever spawn, uh, the very first spawn actually always spawns at level two. Um, but then, okay, when it respawns, it looks at the average level of the game, it goes, okay, am I level three, am I level four, am I level five, what level am I? Um, and if you are two levels below that, when you then slay that camp, um, you are going to get 50 bonus XP. If you fill the little camp, you're going to get 100 bonus XP. Now, keep in mind, jungle items give you 60 bonus XP in the first place. Um, so, um, you know, and, and camps themselves are worth, like, in total, 170-ish, 160 around there. Um, so, you know, 160 could become 210 if there's comeback XP on that camp. That's actually pretty meaningful, right? That's a that's an increase of about one third. That's that's not trivial. Um, I think that's about the right numbers. I think that that's roughly where the numbers are. Um, I have them written down somewhere else, but uh, it's not important to look them up. Uh, but yeah, camps are worth like about a third extra if you're somehow two levels below the average. Now, keep in mind, this is still going to put you to one level below average, which is like still pretty weak, um, considering that supports bring the average down quite a bit. Uh, but, okay, cool, you're not going to be completely out of the game with some bonus XP. You're still not getting bonus gold, you're still going to have less income if you did get all your camps poached and your ganks all failed and you got killed a couple of times, like, but, okay, you are somewhat in the game, you can have some levels, you can have a bit more impact, like, I'm a fan of that, I think that's good. Now, I w the reason I brought up the, that uh, the jungle item itself gives 60 bonus XP is one thing I th am thinking about here is the idea of support poaching, uh, because I think there is a totally reasonable decision to say, hey, I'm going to leash this Gromp and give a, a, a minus four level Soraka the Gromp kill. Because Soraka's going to get 100 bonus XP off of that. Actually, um, she's going to get, what, 150 bonus XP off that if she's four levels behind the average. And that's that's not unrealistic. Um, 
Uh, I had a video a week or so ago, maybe two weeks ago, about the value of XP, and in general, the value of one point of experience is worth more the lower level you are. Well, the lower level you are, not only is your XP worth more, but the XP per camp skyrockets on top of that, considering the base camp, uh, you know, for a jungler is worth maybe 100 and, what do we say, like 160? Um, and then if you are three levels down, um, it's it's instead like 250. Like 160 on an okay level jungler versus um, 250 on a level support it is a massive difference in value there and and honestly probably worth handing over. Um, I don't know if you can really, really game this and like really intentionally starve yourself as support, but I do know that um, for level supports and, and high level supports, roam out of their lanes a lot and sacrifice a lot of XP, letting the 80 carries level up or whoever the duo lane uh, partner is to level up a lot, um, which means supports are going to be well beyond two levels under average. And I really believe there is an argument to be made around donating these camps over to the Nautilus or the Alistair or whatever, um, making it an occasional objective to just hand them a level every once in a while. Um, I think that can be really valuable. So that that's my thought on how this is going to, to turn out. Uh, we'll see. All right. So simplification on Smite. Um, th instead of being 390 to 1,000, nonlinear, by the way, it scales up. Uh, it's, it's somewhat parabolic. Um, it's just 450, and then when your smite's done, it's 900. Um, so rip the days of, of 1,000 damage smites, but keep in mind you only had more than 900 damage on smite at level 17 plus. Um, so until your jungler reached beyond level 16, the 900 is still a big buff, uh, buff to the, the smite power. Um, as far as 450, it's also better in most cases. As far as for people growing spellbook, once it is your second uh, summoner spell grabbed, it becomes the 900 version of smite. Um, which is, I mean, well beyond the time that a jungle is going to have that, so I think that's reasonable. Um, and hey, by the way, if you don't have hard CC, like if you're Kindred, you could just early smite the Scuttle, it'll break the shield, then deal 450, and hey, Kindred has a really easy Scuttle take, that's kind of nice for all these champions who didn't have, um, who didn't have a nice time taking Scuttle. So, uh, there's some nice clear speed buffs for some of the non-absurd clears. I mean, think about the ones who really were absurd at it, right? Udyr, um, you know, Hecarim, uh... Okay, I guess Lily gets buffed by this, but you know, Udyr, Hecarim, Morgana, those things all had had hard CC that they would just start the camp off with, and and off, and you know, on we went. So, um, kind of nice there that if you feel like you're safe, you can smite to start the camp, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna do, you know, well over half his health as a result. So that's kind of nice. Um, so here is the math on smite damage. Um, technically level five and six. I'm assuming level seven is around the time you've you've used your fifth smite and have level and have uh, converted your your smite around. That's debatable. Sure. Keep in mind, um, your second smite is at level four. Um, basically your second smite is up for your sixth camp, or if you wait, uh, it's up for scuttle. Um, your sixth camp is how you get level four. So that's, that's, you know, when you have your, your second smite of the rotation. Um, but of course, XP gain slows down over time, uh, because the XP to level really specifically is what, what increases over time. So I think level seven is a reasonable break point for that. And yeah, it's actually a pretty huge increase. Um, so you know, your first few smites, because you're smiting at level one or level two, um, this removes the optimization of waiting till to getting level two to use your first smite. So if you are doing like a, a uh, leashless red, you should probably just smite your first camp because getting out of your first camp as soon as possible and just getting more base AD and more attack speed and a second spell is a clear speed buff. So if you're going to smite at all, you probably should just smite the first camp. Um, it was an optimization that was probably worthwhile even, um, even before the change because... 20 damage is, is not that meaningful uh, when you consider the DPS gain of just being level 2 and starting your second camp. Uh, but, okay, whatever. Um, but, yeah, this tells you, no, really, there's no reason to, like, wait to smite. Just just smite your first camp, and then if you don't need, if you don't need smite for Scuttle, then, then sure, just go smite another camp at level 3 with, you know, now 80 total bonus damage on your clear, because 60 level 1 and then you know, 20 here. But, you know, otherwise you're saving it for a Scuttle, and, you know, even in your Scuttle smite, uh, fight. It's the exact same number. So, hey, look at us. It's the exact same stuff. No big deal. Um, and then, yeah, once once you're later on, um, you know, the first time you're going for dragon around like level six or something, yeah, your smite's a bit worse. Uh, you know, this is like your your fourth or fifth smite is, is not going to be quite as good. Um, but then, yeah, later on, cool. You have better smite again until level 16 is equal and then level 17 and 18 is better. Okay, cool beans. Um, next up, your smite also heals for 50% uh, more than before. Um, you know, your smite again is only up twice per clear. Um, on your first way through, it's up kind of once per clear, uh, on any other time through, uh, pretty much, uh, okay, sometimes too, if you, you know, weren't burning it on Scuttle, or, you know, you're not saving blue or red smite, or you don't have blue or red smite yet, uh, for PvP combat, um, 
And then, okay, the Omni Vamp is slightly down, and this is going to be part of a, a larger set of changes, okay? So the, the Smite heals up, the Omni Vamp uh, from items is down. What this means is the more you're relying on Smite to heal, kind of, um, the more you're getting uh, back. But keep in mind that you still have to just deal the full health of every jungle monster to heal in the first place. So, like, almost no matter how this goes, you're just healing for... 8 becoming 10% of the total health pool of the jungle. That's just how the math works. Um, but, okay, yeah, if if you do smite occasionally in your own jungle, then it's going to be worth more. And if you're getting invaded and, you know, you have to smite for health, okay, well, this is worth more. Um, if you're stuck in a dragon fight and you might be getting killed and you have to smite for health, okay, this is worth a bit more. So, hey, those points kind of matter. Um, the other part that matters is that jungle camps deal a fair bit less damage. And what's kind of nice is there's actually a lot of consistency. So um, we'll do the actual numbers a bit uh, later on, but what I want to point out is um, blue and red already dealt the same damage, but now Gromp also has the same total AD as blue and Gromp. Um, similarly, um, small raptors and small wolves have the same uh, total attack damage. And um, the other minor thing is that now every single camp in the game exactly triples its attack damage uh, as it levels. Now, one thing to point out, by the way, is uh, Jungle Monster AD does not scale linearly. Um, first of all, camps can actu actually can't be level 1. They always uh, are level 2, but level 1 and level 2 have the exact same values. Also, camps can't actually be... Um, I don't know if they can't be level 18, but they don't have any different stats for level 18. The stats stop scaling at level 17. Um, so this really could have said levels 2 to 17. It would have been kind of identical. Um, so, okay, whatever there. Um... Functionally, camps can't be level 18 for anything that matters in the sense that, like, if the average champion level is, is 18 versus 17, like, you're not going to get comeback XP anyway, so whatever. It's it's kind of irrelevant. Anyway, um, so, so yeah, uh, camps level at, at you know, they have a number when they spawn, which is at 2. Uh, they have values at, like, 3, 5, 7. So, like, basically, the first time they respawn... They expect to be level 3, but in case they would be level 4, there's no numerical difference. Um, and then if they respawn at level 5 versus level 6, there's no numerical difference. And then it keeps going like every odd level, and then it just like breaks down from there. But again, it's not linear. So so the thing to point out here as we do this, um, this is this is blue, red, and gromp, um, is that this number is accurate, and this number is accurate, and then these are just made up along the way. Okay? This is assuming like flat linear between level 2 and level 7. That is not true. But, I mean, these anchor points are, and the rest of the numbers in the middle are close enough. So, okay. What this means is, oh, blue and red and gromp, actually, well, gromp less, blue and red deal 5% less damage to junglers. So, okay, my smite heals for more, my omnivant, um, you know, heals for less, and blue and red deal 5% less damage to me when I'm doing my first camp. So, you know, my leashless clear is a little bit healthier. Um, Gromp does 2% less damage and eventually becomes 8% less damage. Okay, Gromp is the same threat, whatever. But okay, the, the, the buffs are, you know, a little bit nicer in the early game, and then again, because they don't scale as hard, you know, the late game camps don't hurt as much either, but... I mean, pretty much every late game jungler, I don't think, really took damage from camps, but who knows? I mean, hey, their damage triples, so cool beans. Um, all right, what about Big and Small Wolf? Okay, well, Big Wolf is actually down 17% on the first clear. That's a really substantial DPS. And in fact, um, the Small Wolves are down even more, right? They're down They're down 37% um, damage. And in fact, look at the comparison here, right? Small Wolves do like, what, two-sevenths? I think that's the right math. They they do 28% of the damage. So, you know, um, there's, there's you know, 20 total, we'll call it DPS, uh, from the small wolves, because there's two of them, and there's 35 total DPS from the big wolf. Keep in mind, before this was 32 to 42, now it's 20 to 35. Um, so the camp got shifted way towards the big wolf being the primary damage dealer, as well as the primary durability. Now, I do have math somewhere else on the total health of the camp versus, um, you know, the health on each individual monster versus the total damage of the monsters. Um, that I don't think is really worth, you know, hardcore breaking down in the patch rundown to like say, hey, what's the ideal monsters to kill first or last? But the thing to point out is, okay, wolves are, are substantially less damage, right? Like Gromp barely got touched, red and blue got touched a little bit, and wolves got hit pretty meaningfully. Okay, what about small and big raptors? Oh, well, big raptors are actually the same at level one. Small raptors are down a little bit, but keep in mind, there's way more small raptors, right? So um, there's, what, five of them? So this actually lost uh, 15 damage, again, quote, quote, per second. This lost seven plus six plus six. This lost 12 plus seven is 19. 
and this lost 15. Now, again, the base attack speed of the camps matters, but, like, right, th this this looks like less of a, of a buff to junglers, but actually, because there's so many of these, it's... Yeah, it's still less above the junglers, but by less, you know, stark than you would think, right? This is this is now, you know, instead of 20 plus, um, what, 65 um, is 85. And, you know, 85 becomes 70. Uh, this was, what, 74 becomes 55. There, there's your, there's your, there's your numbers, right? If that, if that was followable, whatever. Uh, but still, yeah, okay. Meaningful, meaningful damage change. Uh, small raptors. And, and and hey, this scales up a little bit as time goes on. Uh, again, wolves got hit the most, but as things only ever triple in damage, okay, big raptors kind of plateau a little bit lower. Small raptors plateau a lot lower. Okay, another AoE camp that got hit pretty heavily in terms of damage output. Then we go to look at uh, big krug and medium krug. Uh, big krug actually is pretty tanky, but hey, it lost very, very little damage. Hey, by the way, the damage still triples. Uh, but again, wanted to make krugs a little bit friendlier, so indeed it is. Um... But it basically says, hey, look, if your single target damage is good, you know, if you're Master Yi or Lee Sin or something, and keep in mind, uh, one thing to point out, every single big uh, monster in the jungle, uh, so large, not epic, every single large monster has exactly 20 armor and 20 MR. Now, their health totals are different, and their, their health to DPS ratios are probably different as well. So in terms of, like, how deadly is Big Krug versus its time to kill, like, that, that's probably, you know, non-standard compared to, say, like, Big Raptor. Um, and again, base attack speeds are relevant here as well for, for things like this. But, um, again, right, the really big single camps, like, you know, Big Krug got hit by 2%. Big Raptor got hit by 0 Big Gromp got hit by 2%. Big Red and Blue got hit by only 5%. Um, right, the, the big single camps that you are maybe smiting or maybe burning down with single target, they didn't lose much damage, but the big AOE parts did, right? Medium Krugs lost 20% of their damage, right? 20% of damage is, you know, how much Raptors lost. It's, okay, yeah, it's a lot more, but, you know, sort of-ish how much Wolves lost. Um, the Mini Krugs, I think, are really, really irrelevant, but, yeah, 4 damage from 17 is about 1 quarter. That's, you know, 25-ish percent um, off the damage. Again, so so the AOE camps lost uh, pretty substantial DPS to the tune of, like, 20-25%. The single target camps lost 2-5%. to 5%, Um and, and then those numbers all grow quite a lot as time goes on. Now, the one final thing to point out, um, because Smite is doing, what, um, you know, about 50 more damage at the very beginning of the game, um, I guess 60 more damage at the very beginning of the game, it means that, hey, by the way, um, red and blue buff, well, they've got 50 more health the first time around because you're smiting something for 50 more damage very early on. So we're not trying to buff the clear speeds overall. Blue and red have identical stats, which is good. I'm glad about that. And then, hey, the Rift Scuttle also, by the way, got 50 more health in the early game. Um, Rift Scuttle actually does scale dynamically by level if technically somehow no one does anything and you're just chaotically fighting in a really long level one for three minutes. Scuttle can actually spawn at level one. Um, it's the only jungle monster that can do that. Uh, but regardless... 50 more health on Rift Scuttle. Yeah, sure. Uh, by this point in time, actually, considering that you're going to be using your level 4 smite, you actually don't um, have a stronger smite than before in terms of the raw gains. But, um, you know, the, the the 50 extra on the health is, well, you can smite off the shield or, you know, otherwise if you were Morgana or something, you would have just bound off the shield regardless. So it's not like you're going to be in a bad spot anyway and, and your clear is going to be fine. 50 health is just not that meaningful. Um, then finally, because the camps respawn more slowly, Krug camp is worth 6 more gold, Wolves are worth 10 more gold, Raptors are worth 10 more gold, Gromp is worth 5 more gold. So what's worth pointing out is the big far side camps that okay sure sometimes are poached by laners um but, okay and yes obviously raptors are poached by laners too but like you know the big far side camps that are that are that are uh poached by either losing bottom lanes or sometimes winning bottom lanes or winning top laners um those are only worth five more but also they are the camps that power clearers make sure they go out of their way to actually grab because the camps are worth so much by comparison Wolves and Raptors, because they only gained 5 or 6 gold. Uh, wolves and Raptors gained 10 gold, so the ones in the middle that are always easily part of the route, that are easily grabbed up by, you know, Lee Sin or whatever, um, those are worth a lot more. It also means, by the way, that's kind of a buff to uh, AoE junglers, which is interesting because um, Riot buffed the durability of non-AoE junglers, but they kind of buff the relative gold value of AoE junglers because they just evaporate the wolves or they evaporate the Raptors really fast. I realize Krugs are kind of an AoE camp in the first place, but since you have to kill Big Krug to like advance the camp, it's still kind of a single target camp because it's going through the big Krug and then going through the two medium Krugs after the big Krug dies. 
are the limiting factors there, right? If you're like Master Yi or Lee Sin, whatever, like the other things just die to, um, you know, your Tiamat or, you know, just your spells AOE damage for the most part. Okay, so here is um, uh, showing, by the way, that, that Scuttle Gold scales, by the way. Um, but uh, the one that we really look at is is this. Um, so this is the total value of the jungle, not counting the buff camps, because the buff camps were completely unchanged in any way. Um, here is the total gold value of the camp before and after. As we saw, again, it's like a 5% increase to uh, the far side camps. It's a 12, 13% increase to the middle side camps. Um, and then because the jungle respawns more slowly, okay, what is the total gold income per minute? Well, even though they're only worth, you know, they're worth plus five, the jungle respawns more slowly. There is, in fact, less gold income in the jungle. Asterisk here, we'll get to it in a minute. Um... Um, um, okay, after this here, we'll get to it in a minute. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, what is my brain doing here? Uh, okay, we'll talk about it later. Okay, so, um, if, if you could snap your fingers every time you were at a camp, and the camp disappeared, and the camp disappeared, and the camp disappeared, and the camp disappeared, and so every two minutes, 15 seconds, you did it again, every two minutes, you did it again, it just ran through the jungle, you spent whatever time it took to, to, to walk the whole way, but you snap your fingers, which means, um, every camp, uh, spawns and dies exactly two minutes after it you know, spawns and then dies exactly two minutes after, um, and then dies again, and then spawns and dies immediately after. And so it's actually giving you golden income every two minutes. Every, every individual camp is giving you gold income every two minutes, or XP income every two minutes. That's not true in the real world. There, there is some time delay, but, you know, in, in the Snap Your Fingers case, that's what it was, right? That is that is the timer. Um, so, yeah, a 7% nerf to Krugs, um, a 6% nerf to Gromp. But, hey, it's 0.3 gold per minute for Wolves and 0.3 positive gold per minute actually for Raptors. It's like, oh, if I am in a weird spot where I'm only cycling the middle camp for some reason, the jungle's actually buffed because I have free time to, like, go take a scuttle or fight Rift Herald or gank bot lane and thus earn gold income. Like, if these were the own, you know, if these were the actual numbers on every camp, you know, this functional change, this would be a strict buff the jungle. That's not what every camp is. And indeed, um, you know, if you were just full clearing and snapping your fingers, clearing every camp instantly, it would indeed be a 4% gold per minute, in, uh, you know, decrease. But you cannot snap your fingers and delete the camps. Let's assume a camp on average takes 15 seconds. Is that too high or too low? Maybe. But let's say it takes an extra quarter minute of clear time per camp. Uh, you know, on average, which means instead, oh wait, what? Am, no, 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 no. What are you doing? Um, 2.25. Yes, thank you. What? Why is this doing? What's going on here? Why is it being funky? What? Okay, there we go. All right. So that means is you know instead of the the camps you know dying two minutes after they spawn, the old camps died two and a quarter minutes after they spawn because on average a camp took fifteen seconds. Should it be a little bit higher, a little bit lower? Yeah, maybe, but who cares? Like, we're, we're just going for, for napkin math here, right? Um, so then we grab this one. And now what does it look like, right? If our average clear time on an, on the average camp is 15 seconds, such that it took us um, actually a full minute of, of clear to go through the entire jungle. Yeah, it's probably on the slow side. That's probably not really true. It's like, well, look what happens. It's like, well, you know, we're actually, you know, strictly gold income positive. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with this. Um, I'm just gonna, like, double check that we're not doing anything silly. Yeah, okay, we're fine here. Um, so if it takes us, on average, 15 seconds to clear each individual camp, but again, that's not really true, you know, 15 seconds. And, and here, think about it another way. It's not even just, does it take 15 seconds to kill the clamp? It's because of pathing and, and having to get stuff done or do whatever else, if camps on average are alive for 15 seconds, because I had stuff to do um, in the old jungle and in the new jungle, because again, I'm doing more stuff. If camps are on average alive for 15 seconds, what's it mean now? It's like, well, I, I mean, I guess I'm losing 2.5% of my gold income. But like, I get 15 extra seconds of freedom. Like I'm losing four gold per minute, but I have fifty. But I have thirty extra seconds of freedom, you know, or whatever. Like, yeah, I can I can make that up, right? Every every two jungle clears, I have thirty extra seconds of freedom. At the cost of sixteen gold per two jungle clears. 
functionally. Kind of. Like, that's not exactly accurate, because, again, this is, you know. Um, we're, we have to prorate based on time, and it gets kind of funky, but whatever, right? Um, you know, and, and to be clear, like, if you really were someone who just, like, spent three minutes between clears, and you weren't using this timer anyway, then you're just objectively earning more money. Right, so so there's a lot of ways to look at this that it's a a just strict buff. Um, obviously, if you are really really engaged in pure power clearing, and and the camps are alive for you know six seconds on average, right, and it's actually you know this, um, then yeah, you know it, it is an income nerf, right, and and we're not getting you know quite as much, and and you know six seconds live on average is actually you know pretty pretty generous for power clearing if if every camp is live for 6 seconds on average for the entire game then yeah you're maybe earning a little bit less money but are camps alive for 6 seconds on average the entire game no well then yeah guess what what this means is we're probably earning more gold overall as junglers um now we are earning less xp overall as junglers experience was not buffed except for the ketchup xp which i think in a lot of cases is not going to be happening on average maybe junglers will have more xp because there are going to be junglers on average who you know some of them are going to get behind and thus use the ketchup xp and thus end up ahead um but yeah here we go i also realized we have clearly gone past an hour to be fair at least spending time in the jungle was a good spending place a good place to spend time on we had almost half an hour of jungle that seems a bit more reasonable Alrighty, huge uh, VFX of the Kog'Maw. That looks awesome. Can't wait to see that one in game. Looks cool. Um, but a bunch of bug fixes in QOL. Okay, whatever. Uh, new skins. These look really, really sweet. Looking forward to that. And let us TLDR patch 11.10. We've got a bunch of nerfs. Mostly aimed at high elo. Jinx just too good everywhere. Kog'Ma looks prettier. Gore Drinker, Abyssal Mask, and Rookmaker are buffed. Rage Blades buffed. Phase Rush is nerfed. Jungle is... I would argue actually buffed overall. It's a bit closer. Kale kind of likes Yumi Zyra, all buffed. All right, Bard, 10 flat damage with the passive, not a big deal. Slight overperformer, not a huge problem. Um, like, he's already strong. He's it's going to remain strong. It's not it's not a, a big thing. Um, Darius, really meaningful nerf to the E. Uh, I know the designer's trying to find a somewhat high elo skewed Darius nerf because uh, Darius is overperforming in high elo, not in low to mid. So that's what they're trying with this one. Cool beans, I'm a fan. Two to six seconds off the upper hand. Pretty meaningful, it's max second. Uh, Galio nerfed, I would say, more for support than for mid. Mid Galio will not feel this nerf until level eight or higher, as uh, mid Galio maxes W second. But support Galio maxes at first, so from level four onward, it's going to be felt, which is um, an increasingly uh, worse uh, shield to the tune of 25% by level nine. And two seconds off the uh, shield of the Rand eventually cooldown, which, yeah... Eh. It's going to be felt a little bit. Uh, so, you know, moderate nerf, not huge. Galio's still good. Jinx loses two armor and occasionally loses the high health execute on Mega Death Rocket. The armor nerf certainly matters. The execute, I think, is not that big of a deal. Jinx is going to lose, like, 1% win rate. Uh, Katarina with five move speed. Yep, meaningful nerf here. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not a ton, but it's going to move the win rate by 1% or so. Um, Kale now scales much better to 625, which I think is actually pretty meaningful for late game Kale. Muramana may actually be a good item on her. We'll see. And uh, some more AP ratio for the Lich Bane and uh, Riftmaker builds, plus Riftmaker is getting buffed. Next up is Kennen getting 10 flat damage on the W passive auto attack from Electrical Surge. Uh, this means a little bit for, you know, charging it and then just, you know, poking your opponent out of lane. It's also functionally 2 flat, 2 base AD for on hit Kennen. Maybe 2.4 base AD for on hit Kennen. Not horrible, not outstanding, but yeah, a nice thing. Lux is getting a little bit of something here with uh, 0 to 20 bonus damage on the E and an overall 8% higher AP ratio. Should look pretty nice. Lux should be a pretty strong mid and support. Next up is Sejuani. Uh, just getting a nice little targeting update. Uh, shouldn't get in the way. Should make it a little bit easier to use a champion, but shouldn't mean a whole lot overall. Uh, 0.1 bonus AD ratio nerf on talent Q is not going to be gigantic, but hey, it's a small nerf, so hey, good job. Uh, Thresh loses about 6% of his health at level 1. Uh, functionally, never gets it back because level 17 Thresh doesn't really exist in League of Legends, so yeah, overall nerf for the champion. Seems good. Um, still on the strong side, but a good nerf. Uh, Yumi gets 10 flat damage to the non-empowered Q, 15 flat damage to the empowered Q. Um, really, really, really meaningful, especially early game. Um, still not, you know, bad late game by any means, but really big deal to uh, Yumi's ability to uh, abuse early lanes and get the poke in. There should be a lot of good Yumi lanes out there now. Uh, and a bug fix in W, which is really nice. 
Zyra has a bit of a uh, stronger slow on her E plant, the melee plant, and two seconds off the rampant growth cooldown is somewhat nice, but not a huge deal. Abyssal Mask uh, gets 133 gold of health value, which is uh, not terrible, but not gigantic. Uh, the Unmake getting buffed is a pretty big deal. Abyssal Mask is now by far the most efficient source of health and MR. Um, you are only paying about 500 gold for unique passives. Every other item you're paying much more for in the in the health MR quadrant. Um, Abyssal Mask definitely should get a bit more of a consideration, which is good because I think it should be a viable item. It's good to see items get viable. Um, cool Beans there. Gore Drinker. Slightly stronger on health stacking bruisers who want to tank for frontline. I think it's a well aligned buff. I think Gore Drinker is somewhat underrated. I think it's a good item. Rage Blade, 200 gold cheaper, also pretty good. Um, yeah, this will this will move the needle on you know Callista or Varus or Kale or whatever choosing to go for Rage Blade builds when they don't have to, but could choose to. Ginsu's yeah, really not getting picked up, so good buff. I like it. Next up, Riftmaker is now going to stack up at three stacks, not five. That is a pretty meaningful deal. Um, you know, up until that point, the stacks are just worth more. And then even though technically 9% amp versus 10% damage amp is not as good, um, the fact that it turns on at all sooner, um, both because it now starts stacking when you're taking damage, that's going to matter. Um, and it's just going to, you know, turn on at full stack sooner. Uh, this is a strict buff to Riftmaker in virtually all considerable cases. Even if there is the occasional team fight in your game where the five stack Riftmaker would have been better, um, you know, there's one fight out there where it would have been better. Well, the other fights all had a strong Riftmaker at three stacks, so a strict buff to Riftmaker in all games for all champions who would have bought it. Phase Rush gets absolutely destroyed with a double cooldown in the early game. And even when the cooldown eventually does get better around like level 16 or so, uh, we have the data table, we'll, we'll pull it up. Uh, that's here. Yeah, level 14 where the cooldown finally gets better. Um, even when the cooldown finally is better, the base movement speed is still going to be lower at that point in time. So phase rush is definitively nerfed for virtually the entire game. This is a really, really meaningful nerf. This matters a lot. Now, it means more for laners than it does for junglers because junglers aren't using this cooldown anyway. They're going to get off once per gank and they're not even using it at level one either. So yeah, it's, it's less of a big deal. Um, in the flat 10% move speed nerf is more like, you know, an 8% move speed nerf or a 6% move speed nerf and the cooldowns are relevant. So less of a nerf for junglers, really big nerf for laners. Next up, the jungle now respawns 15 seconds slower for non-buff camps. Smite is now 450 or 900, no take backsies. Uh, there is now comeback XP in case you're really far behind in levels. Um, Smite now breaks scuttle crab shield. Smite's worth more health. Omnivamp slightly lower, but the camps deal a lot less damage. Now, Red Buff, Blue Bluff, Red Buff, Blue Buff, Gromp, and Big Krug all do like 2 to 5% less damage. It's not a really big deal. But the Wolf Camp and the Raptor Camp um, and the other parts of Krugs all do something like 25% less damage overall. That's, that's a rough, rough estimate. There's specific numbers, but they don't really matter. Ultimately, that means if you are a slow single target clearing jungler, you are taking a lot less damage from the camps that you hate. Um, and even in general, these camps, more of their damage comes from the big wolf and the big raptor and the big krug, meaning that, you know, being Lee Sin or Master Yi and auto attacking down the big krug or big wolf or big raptor is going to do more to cut the DPS of the camp. Um, it, in probably most cases, changes the math back to kill the big one first, then kill the small ones afterwards. If you have, you know, one little small AoE ability, like a Lee Sin E or something, okay, get your jungle end up taking on them, but focus the big one. That's going to lower the damage faster, um, and, and thus you're going to take less damage from the camp. So even though you are getting less Omnivamp, champions are overall taking less damage from the jungler. They are coming out of the clear uh, healthier and... Okay, cool. So more players and more champions are going to be more successful clearing their jungle. Cool beans. Now, because the camps respawn more slowly, uh, the two big camps in the side are worth five, or in Greg's case, six more gold than the total camp. Uh, but the small ones in the middle um, are worth 10 more gold on the total camp. That's pretty meaningful. Uh, ultimately, it means that even if you are turbo clearing, uh, the gold per minute from the inside camps is flat. The gold per minute from the outside camps has been somewhat lowered. But the the longer it takes you to clear the camps, and the longer you're waiting before retaking them because you got stuff to do like ganking, uh, the more this math moves towards, well, you subjectively get more gold per minute. Um, keep in mind, it is very hard to always clear the camps perfectly on time every time. And keep in mind that your first clear is not affected by jungle respawn timers. The first clear just simply has 31 more gold in it. 
straight up. A six camp clear has 31 more gold. And hey, by the way, um, if if your you know Lee Sin clear skips uh Krugs and Raptors, um okay, well you're missing out on 15, you're missing out on 16 gold, but you still earned 15 more gold from the four camps you did. Um is that really a buff to Lee Sin? Maybe not, but hey, you are still getting more gold than your previous clears, so hey, that's something. Um but yeah, it means that the diversions to Gromp are worth slightly less. The diversions to Krugs are still really, really valuable, but worth slightly less. There's, you know, a math argument there somewhere. Um, real quick, here is the data table. Um, the new data table on the gold income of each camp. Hey, by the way, Wolves now beats Gromp and only beats Raptors by five. Just by the way, Krugs is still the king. Sure, whatever. But hey, here's the total gold income of the camp stacked up now. Just thought you, sh you, know, thought you might like to know. Um, Raptors are, um, less bad in that sense. Um, but also means that, um, hey, by the way, pushing Raptors is a bigger deal. Um, you know, like this, this is a, a buff to counter jungling because Raptors are now carrying more of the overall weight of the camp gold. Just, you know, thought that's worth noting. All right. Um, and then Kogma looks prettier. Um, that's pretty much it. That's the TLDR, the patch rundown. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I was wrong. We still went hour 20. I just can't do these fast. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.